Okay, I'll, I'll pose the question in the sequence of equalities. First of all, what's the pattern in these first three? Okay. Well, you got three here, you got two here, you got one here. Let me three here, two here, and one here, right? Then what would come next? Nick? Three, two, one. What's the next number you have? Show me some fingers. Three, two, one. What comes next? Yeah, zero. Okay. And you keep counting down. What comes next? You might have trouble showing me that with your fingers. Okay, so again, if you're engaged in this, is it that? Excuse me. This camera is misbehaving in really obnoxious ways today. Okay. Uh, If you're engaged in this as a distance student or somebody's missed class, you should be answering these questions yourself. But okay, we go three, two, one, what comes next? Zero. Now three, two, one, zero, what comes next? Well, you're able to tell me negative one. Then three, two, one, zero, negative one, what comes next? Negative two. Okay. Uh, well, right there are the numbers that you have, right? Except of course it's two to the third. Two to the second, two to the first, two to the zero, two to the negative one, two to the negative two. Now, what would we put down here? We just what's the next line going to read? What what number is going to go in the green circle? Write it down. Okay. So well, what's next is two to the negative three. Three, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. The pattern becomes very clear. And then we go two to the negative four equals, and we can go on. Okay. Of course, we wanted to go up this way. We don't have room on the board, but we wanted to go up this way. Next, it'll be two to the fourth, two to the fifth, two to the sixth, right? Okay. Now, let's just look at these numbers. I'm going to write them down here. Eight, four, two. What would you do to eight in order to get four? Well, the answer is you divide it by two. If you divide eight by two, you get four. And if you divide four by two, what do you get? Two, right? Okay, well, let's go on with it. If you divide two by two, what do you get? Write it down. Just write these numbers, eight, four, two, and then write what you get when you divide by two. Okay, well, I think everybody sees that that's one. Hopefully we written that down. Okay, now what's next? What do you get if you divide one by two? Let's discuss this. Here's zero, here's eight. This is a number line. Okay. If we cut eight in half, we get four. If we cut four in half, we get two. If we cut two in half, we get one. Okay. Now, if we cut one in half, come over to the middle here. And we get one half. If we cut that in half, we get one fourth. Okay, got a picture? So this sequence is a sequence of numbers we get if we start with eight and keep cutting things down in half. So what we get is we get one half, 
Then we get one fourth. What will come after one fourth? <coughs> so we get one eighth. Notice that we get the numbers now in the denominator that we used to have in the numerator. Okay, or see we're fraction. Whatever number we have here, we get is the denominator over here, right? In other words, this number is a reciprocal of this. This one's a reciprocal of this. This one's a reciprocal of this. Okay. So we start with eight four two here. And uh, what number is going to go here? We're going to follow this pattern, aren't we? So go ahead and write down these numbers. Follow the pattern and see what numbers you get. Okay, that looks pretty good. So yeah, if we're following this pattern, this is half of this, this is half of this. So if the pattern continues and it does, this is gonna be half of this, which means two to the zero has to be one. Now that's a big deal because a lot of people think that two to the zero ought to be zero. As soon as you see a zero, you think you ought to have zero. So you put two to zero into your calculator, it's going to give you one. Calculator knows that because the calculator knows this pattern. Calculator also knows the definition of a zero x pattern. Okay. Now, next one, two to the negative one is. One over two. Just following this pattern, the half of one half is one fourth. Half of one fourth is one eighth. Half of one eighth is one sixteenth. And we can continue. I'll just write down a couple more. Okay. Write down two to the negative fifth, two to the negative six. Just think for a second what that is. You're watching the video, pause, and figure out what these next two ought to be. Okay, well, hopefully pause. Here we are, 1 over 32, 1 over 64, and so on. The pattern just goes on forever, and it'll climb up this way forever. Now, I'm going to notice that 2 to the negative 1 is 1 over 2, but of course, that's one over two to the one, isn't it? Two is two to the one, so this is one over two to the one. This is one over two squared. This is one over two cubed. This is one over two to the fourth. Okay, again, I say this is one over two squared because four is two squared. Two to the negative third, is one eighth. Well, that's one over two to the cube. So we can write that much down just from what we know so far. And then we can continue the pattern. Well, that almost looks like a 24. Let me make that look more like two to the fourth. And this is one over two to the fifth. And looking two. That's a little better. And one over. Two the sixth. Or we should have this board over here for the block of it. Okay. So if we look at what we've got down here, we see that. Two to the negative n has to be one over two to the n. 
And we also see that two to the zero has to equal one. If we believe this pattern, and we have to believe this pattern because two to the first just means two. Two to the second means two times two. Two to the third means two times two times two. If we go up in this pattern, the exponent means that we always have to double. So if we're going up, we double. That means if we're coming down, we got to cut them in half. Okay. So if we go up. We double. If we're going up this, this we double. And if we start down here, if, if, if we go up, we're always doubling. If we go down, we have, but we cut the numbers in half. That's a pattern for this table. No matter where we are in this list, if this list goes on forever, if it's infinitely long in both directions, always, if we go up one line, we're going to double our number. If we're going to increase our x probe by one, we're going to double our number. If we go down one, we're going to decrease the x probe by one and cut the number in half. Okay? Uh, so we can you know, say, okay, up one line. You know, this is all this looking really bad, but I'm not able to write that as clearly as I'd like. You see the difference on the chalk. You can find the one I want to use this one. So if we go up one line, we increase the exponent by one. Double the number to the right of the equal sign. If we go down one line, you got to cut the number in half and decrease the exponent by one. I don't have room to write that. We want to see all of that. So we can begin to understand negative exponents and the reason for the rule for negative exponents. Okay. Well, here's the rule for negative exponents if the number happens to be two. Okay. If we accept this rule, then it'd be consistent in our mathematics. A to the negative n has to be one over a to the n. Okay, now you've done the open math assignment. On exponents. On, on, I'm I'm sorry, on the, the toolkit functions, one of the first assignments you have 
if you're in my class, my pre-calculus class, that you learn to sketch a number of graphs without using any numbers. Now today in class will connect that with the numbers, but um, so you know how to do it. Now, unfortunately, in my opinion, open math, as you calculate the numbers in these tables, using a calculator, which doesn't connect you with the numbers or with any patterns. It just gets you the right answer without having a real foundation. So we want to get the right answer, but we want to do it using rules, not using a calculator. Now, if you want to do the calculator, and if you want to do the square of 1.789, then you're probably going to use a calculator because you can't do that in your head. And you can't do that easily on paper. It's too long. Okay? That's probably a legitimate use of calculator. It's not a legitimate use of a calculator to fill in the numbers on this table. So here's my table. Here's Alex. And here's y equals b raised to the x. I'm going to use x values negative 2, negative 1. Zero, one, and two. So can you write down this table? Kind of quickly. I mean, we're not in a big rush, but we want to use class time effectively. So, okay, so first of all, if x equals two, then what's two to the x? Can you tell, show me with your fingers? Can you do that in your head? Or do you need to write it out? Well, people need to write it out. Maybe everybody needs to write it out. Okay, so can you tell me what it is without? I'm not getting any books. That's all right. That's kind of what you expect. Because the kind of process is what does it mean to do two to the x? Well, what it means is, if x is 2, we write out 2, and we replace x by 2. So x is 2, so 2 to the x is going to be 2 to the second. Now, what's 2 to the second power? Can you tell what 2 to the second power is? Yeah, it's 4. Then just to be sure, you know, that's 2 times 2. That's what it means. Which is four. Okay. Now, what's two to the first power? Well, that means we just got one two here, right? That's just plain old two. And it's two to the second means we write down two twos and multiply them together. Two to the first means we just write down one two and there's nothing else to do with it. Okay. So we got two to the second, which is two. Now, 2 to the 0, you tell me what 2 to the 0 is? Yeah, it's 1. 2 to the 0 is 1. And we establish that by this pattern. Once we see this pattern in mathematics, we understand there's that pattern. And we have no choice but to make 2 to the 0 equal 1 if we want everything to be consistent. If we want the rules of exponents to be consistent. We want this pattern to work from positive to negative numbers. Two to the zero has to be one. Okay, now, what's two to the negative one? Well, we have this rule here. And of course, we just did two to the negative one. You've got a table in front of you that you made that shows us what two to the negative one is. But uh, we write it out like this, two to the negative one equals one over two to the one, which is one over two, one half. All right, so 
And then, if x is negative 2, we write 2 to the negative 2, which is 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 over 2 times 2, which is 1 fourth. And of course, we could extend this table as far as we want because we've just seen that the pattern is the powers of two. So we could extend the table from x equals three, but from x equals negative six to x equals three, then we'd have our number. Okay. We'd also know where those numbers go on the number line. Now, after we get to one fourth, things start getting pretty close to zero and it gets hard to mark with chalk. You got a good pencil, well, you can mark a couple more, but pretty soon you just don't even have room between your dots. Okay? So these numbers converge down towards zero. Your negative exponents give you smaller and smaller numbers. They're always positive, they're always bigger than zero. So it's worth understanding that. Okay? Now, the reason I choose this function, which I don't think you even see in open math till sometime in April, uh, is because, first of all, it's arguably the most important function <laughs> in the universe. And uh, second, because it's got unique properties of the graph that make it easy to invert, okay? what we want to talk about is inverse functions. So all this you should know because we've had assignments, but of course all this is new to you and you might not have put it all together. All right, now, and then now we make a graph. Of this function, we put negative two here and we can put two here. And we can cut negative two and a half and get negative one. We can cut two and a half and we get one. And then, of course, we'll put one half in here. And I'm not going to label it because it's going to clutter things up. But I think we understand that this is one negative one half and this is one half. Then on the y axis, and let's go ahead and do this. In such a way that the Y scale and the X scale are pretty much the same. Yeah, I'm getting clean enough. Let's um, Okay. So we're going to want four units here. So yeah, we can go up to four here. We'll put four right here. And the y-axis goes on up. And as we've done in my class, I like to divide four and a half to get two to make sure that we get a reasonably consistent scale. Then I divide two and a half to get one. And my one here looks like it's about the same size as my one here. So uh, maybe we're okay. And then three would go up here. Then one half would go here and one fourth would go here. Why do I put all those marks down? Well, my first point, okay, here's the table. Now here's the table with all the calculations. I'm gonna write the table down. With just the numbers. This is going to be one fourth. This is going to be one half. This is going to be one. This is going to be two. This is going to be four. Okay, so when x equals negative two, y is one fourth, right? Well, here's the line x equals negative two. And Here's the line y equals one fourth. Well, 
So I can put a form here. When f equals negative one, y is one half. So I sketch a line for x equals negative one. And a line for y equals one half. And when those lines meet, I have my graph point. Then when x is zero, y is one. Well, x is zero on the y axis, and y is one here. That's going to give me a point about here. When x is 1, y is 2. So I get a point here. And when x is 2, y is 4. And I get a point here. Now, the pattern of those points and the curve that you get should be familiar to you if you're in my class. And probably if you're in any of the other classes, uh, you probably started with the toolkit functions. So you recognize this as your toolkit function. Y equals two to the X. If you're in my class, you've seen a different way of graphing this, and you're going to have a quiz today where you got to graph it two minutes or less by constructing it without referring to any numbers. But what we're doing here should be pretty familiar to you, and I'm not going to say any more about it because not everybody's in my class. Uh, and in, in, in my class, we do this uh, by construction because it gets people used to the plane and used to the numbers, even though we sacrifice some time. Uh, and I, I ask them whether this gives people a better foundation for using these functions. We'll see how that works out. Okay. Now, You write the table again. And you might just this side note, you might wonder why I don't include negative one half and one half here. I don't include it because you don't know how to calculate it. I don't know how to calculate it exactly. I know how to calculate it to arbitrary precision if I've got time to do that. Your calculator doesn't know how to calculate it exactly. It can't be calculated exactly. So I don't include it. We don't need it. We get the pattern very easily without using negative one half or one half as an X value. And I don't want to use something when we're trying to lay a foundation that requires the use of a calculator. Okay. Calculator is very handy for a lot of things, and we do use it. But that's why I'm not using it here. Now, if you're in a class that wants to use a calculator, and I'm not denigrating them, there's anything wrong with that. I'm the same way I do it the way I do it. Okay? But if you're in a class that use a calculator, you really feel like you ought to have negative one half in there and use your calculator to get it, go ahead. Okay. But I, I find it unnecessary for this purpose. Um, okay. Now, we're going to do another table. 
of X versus Y, or Y versus X, actually. For Y is the inverse function, the function inverse the two to the X. Okay. Now, until I tell you, you're not going to know what to do, but what you do is very simple. Make this table, you just switch columns. The numbers in the right column go under X. The numbers in this column go under Y. So what was in the X column goes into the Y column. The Y column here goes into the X column. So can you make that table and then sketch a graph? Okay, people are working on this. Just keep working on it. You don't have to watch this. I'll tell you when you need to watch. Um, so we have x values are going to be x values here are going to be the y values here. So we're going to have one four, one half, one, two, four. And the x values here going to the y column, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. So there's the table. Now the next Task is to graph it. So you have to draw a set of X and Y coordinate axes. And maybe something like what I've done here. And then see if you can plot these points. Okay. Now I see that my X values go from one fourth out to four. So in the X axis, I've got to have four out here, not just two as we've had on many graphs, but four. Now we can divide four and a half, we get two. We can divide two and a half and we get one. And we can divide one and a half and we get one half. And we can divide one half and half and we get one four. Now how to write that write those kind of small. But if we know that we're cutting, we're always moving twice as close to the y-axis. And I did a fair job of that. I didn't do it real well, but we still get the idea. Okay. Then we're going to have all the x values that we need. We don't need three, although if we decide that we do need it, we'll, it'll be easy to put it in. We don't need one and a half. Plot this graph. Now, if we're going to use the graph, we probably need some of that. But we'll worry about that when the time comes. Now, for the y values, well, they're equally spaced. They're negative two, negative one, zero. That's just the x axis. One and two. So I can start with my first point. I can draw the line. For x equals one fourth, that's this line here. And the line where y equals negative two. That's here. And the x equals one fourth line. Here, here. And they meet at this point down here. And then x equals one half meets the line where y equals negative one. The y equals negative one line, I'll put it all right here. And the x equals one half line. Would be here, and they meet at this point. And then when x is one, y is zero. Well, x is one here. And y equals zero here, so I don't have to draw that line. And then now I have this point. Then x equals two, which would be this line. And y equals one gives me 
this point. And then x equals four is here. And y equals two is here. No, they okay, simply run over the graph of the exponential function. Without all the lines, just because of time, we want to contrast these two graphs. So I get. This, this graph ought to be familiar to you by now, so you know how to construct it. So there's the graph of the exponential function, and here's the graph of the function we get when we switch the columns. Now we're going to say y equals f of x equals 2 to the x. We've given a name to the 2 to the x function. We call it f of x for our present purpose. The graph we have over here this is the inverse. of y equals f of x equals 2 to the x. We call it y equals f with something that looks like an exponent, negative 1. Okay? Now, it's not an exponent. It's just read as f inverse of x. Because you can't do the negative one power of the name of a function. We can't do the negative one power of your name or my name. Okay? F is the name of the function. We, we, the negative one power is the reciprocal. We can't do the reciprocal of my name or your name or anybody's name. Okay? I guess if somebody was named three, yeah, we could do the reciprocal, and the would be one third. But uh, you understand what I mean. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, this is the name of something. It doesn't mean reciprocal. Um, it's also got a name. The inverse of the exponential function is the log base two function. And I'm not even going to write that down now. We don't have to know that at this point. We'll use it late March or early April when we encounter logarithmic functions. Okay, this is how logarithmic functions are defined. You have to know anything about logarithmic functions. Um, and there's no reason to expect that you would. Okay, so. Here's the table. For y equals f of x equals 2 to the x. Here's the graph we get. Here's the table. For f inverse of x, we just switch the column. So what we're doing is we're switching x and y values. We're switching x and y values. Now instead of writing y equals abbreviated words inverse function, We'll label this y equals f inverse of x. This is the graph of the inverse. This is the graph of the function. You can see how this graph is related to this. 
if we take this graph, flip the paper over and rotate it, we get this graph. Okay. You can imagine having this on paper. You can even put it on paper in darkening so you can see through it. You've got to flip it over, but then rotate it the right way, and it's going to look like this. And that's simply because we've switched the X and the Y axis. Since we switched the X and the Y values here, it's like switching the X and the Y axis. So if we want the x-axis to go where the y-axis is, we could rotate the thing around this way, but then the y-axis would be pointing in the wrong direction, so we have to flip a paper over. Okay. And if that makes sense, you probably take a piece of paper and try to do it. Um, but that's what we mean by an inverse function. Okay. So our definition of the inverse function I'll say the inverse of any function y equals f of x swaps the f at x and y values. I'll also say, as a caveat, that you might or might not understand at this point, but you will when we really study inverse functions. If f is one to one, then the inverse is a function. And we call that f inverse of x. And that's an important idea. But at this point, uh, what I'm trying to do again is give people in the distance section of free calculus a preview, the basic ideas that they're going to need in order to understand what's coming up. Um, and uh, since I don't have any of those people sitting in class as distance students in one course, and typically going to be distance students in another, I haven't yet been able to gauge what they need. So I'm just taking a guess. Uh, but I can also say that for any other class, this will serve, I think, as a, both a valid and a useful introduction to the idea of inverse functions. Now, there's algebra of inverse functions. We might get into that. But we're not going to get into that until I know that the distance students need to. Um, okay. And I'm not teaching the distance course, but I'm in close contact, frequent conversations with the person who is. Now here are the five points that I use when I graph the tool for exponential function. Just to put them in color and do this. 
and my class, and it doesn't hurt for anybody else to see this. And incidentally, uh, if you're in the distance section or any other section of pre-calculus, you haven't even done this function, but it's easy enough to do. Uh, and since we've used this example uh, to look at negative exponents and so forth, uh, we're going to continue with it. Okay, so. We know that this line is x equals negative two. This line is x equals two. Telling your class, you might as well as far as x equals negative three and x equals three when you graph these functions. Right? And then we go up to y equals four. So we get these lines and the x-axis. And we can think of having constructed this function in the rectangle here. And I find the rectangle useful in explaining what happens with transformations. Now, if I <coughs> move that rectangle, let's extend the x-axis a big way. Let's say I move that rectangle over to, but let's say I move this line over for eight units. Now this line is x equals negative 10. And this line will move over to x equals negative six. Now that's two, and that's four. Okay, it's reasonably consistent. And we'll keep the uh, y equals four line at the end. If I take this graph, and of course I got the y axis in the middle here, so I'm going to kind of do a dotted line y axis so that I can draw some points. And the curve. Okay, so this curve, if I've done this correctly, and my, my rectangle here isn't wide enough to depend where it is. Uh, then this curve will be an exact copy of this curve. But every x value on this curve is going to be how much less? I moved over eight units, right? I moved everything over eight units. So I'm going to just put an arrow here and say, okay, we moved negative eight units. Then the equation for this function, well, the equation for this function is y equals f of x. The equation for this function is y equals f of x minus negative 8. Now let's just see if they were consistent here. Okay, on this point, y equals one. So we'll do it over here from this where we can see it. What's the x coordinate at this point? The x coordinate is zero. So this point is zero one.
Well, then you write the formula for this function, it's two to the x. Now, what are the coordinates of this point? Can you tell me what the coordinates are? The y coordinate is one. Is it still on the line where y equals one, right? Can you tell me what the x coordinate is? It's going to be negative, negative what? Okay, I'm having a little trouble answering the question of how far this point gets moved and what its coordinates are going to be. Okay, now how far it gets moved, the whole rectangle has been moved eight units. So this point has to move eight units that way. Now we're going to have a little trouble relating this, and we're going to address that to tell me what the coordinates of the point would be if we took this point and moved it eight units to the left, okay? So I asked about this point. Well, let's think about it. This point is on the line. X equals what? Okay, so we see that this line has to be x equals negative one. It's on this constructed point. Implicitly, we're going from negative two to two, and we have negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. I have to label them all. But here, we're on the x equals one line. Now, the corresponding point on this graph. Question mark, question mark. What are the coordinates of this point? If I move this line eight units this way, it's going to give us a line here. Not space very well, it's not drawn very well, but I understand. Where it is, it has to be eight units to the left because we moved everything eight units to the left, right? If we move the line x equals one eight units to the left, what line are we going to get? X equals what? Negative well, we can count. Where x equals negative one here, we're going to move eight units one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units. So we're going to be at we're at negative one, we're going to be at negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, negative eight, negative nine. That was eight units. We end up at x equals negative nine. I don't have a lot of room up there. I'll label my x equals negative one here, as well as here, and say, okay, we moved eight units, negative eight units, then we're at x equals. Negative one minus eight, we can do by arithmetic. That's negative nine. So the x coordinate of this point is negative nine. What's the y coordinate? Well, we didn't move it up or down. It's still on the line y equals one, as we indicated. Oh, sorry, the line y equals one half. And I'll list that. It's negative nine one half. Now, the thing I want to convince you of is okay
point negative nine one half should be on the graph of y equals f of x minus negative eight. Okay. F of X equals two to the X. F of X minus negative eight should equal two to the X minus negative eight. Now, a minus negative eight is the same as a plus eight. So that should be two to the x plus eight. We're going to let g of x, he's going to give the g of x name for this function, two to the x plus eight. What's g of negative nine? Can you plug negative nine in for x and see what g of negative nine is? Okay, we're running very short of time, so I'm going to go ahead and do this. Not actually look at what you've done, but you should have done this. You'd have two to the negative nine plus eight. And this is going to be a y value. I've inserted the g of x notation there, and I've said y equals g of x equals f of x minus negative eight. f of x minus negative eight to this f of x is two to the x minus negative eight, which is two to the x plus eight. We call that g of x. Okay. G of negative nine is two to the negative nine plus eight. Well, that's two to the negative one. That's one over two to the one by the rule of the exponents, which is one half. Now, let's support at this point. X coordinates negative nine, Y coordinates one half. So that this point is on the graph. y equals g of x equals two to the x plus eight. So when we move this graph eight units to the left, we replaced x by x minus negative eight. That's a horizontal shift. That's a horizontal transformation. That's a transformation that moves the graph eight units to the left. Um, this should illustrate how that transformation works for this function. And it doesn't matter whether your class is studying that whole thing was off the screen. So I need a better monitor. You can't really see. That's my problem. Okay. There again. We constructed this graph, eight units to the left. Uh, everything worked out. This illustrates why that transformation works. And um, I do apologize if a lot of this wasn't traditional when I was talking about it. But there it all is. Move this graph, eight units to the left. You have the formula for this graph. Doesn't matter whether you know about exponential functions or not. You can evaluate two raised to the power. 
just by using basic middle school rules, pre-algebra rules for arithmetic. Um, so that, there's nothing there that import, requires any special knowledge. Um, so again, this function is moved here. We've got a new function, which is f of x minus whatever our shift was. Um, when we looked at what happened to this point, it had to go here if it went eight units to the left. And the coordinates of this point match up with the values that we get when we plug in the x coordinate negative nine and get one half and get this point. So this point and every other point on this graph, if it's a, an exact copy of this, we move eight units to the left, will satisfy this function. So the two to the x function becomes the two to the x minus negative eight function, which is the two to the x plus eight function. That's a horizontal transformation, which is the hardest of the first three transformations probably to understand. 